Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day, without him I would fall. When I am sad to him I go, no other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad, he's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, my friend in trials all. I go to him for blessings and he gives it o'er and o'er. He sends the sunshine and the rain. He sends the harvest golden grain. Sunshine and rain, harvest of grain. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now, I'll trust him when life's waiting day shall end. A beautiful life with such a friend, beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy, he's my friend. <clears throat> oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, a day I will never forget. After I've wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the needs of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling, we made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above, into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made, when as a Savior I came, took of the offer of grace, he did offer the safety of praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now I have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And because of that wonderful day, when at the cross I believe, 
Riches eternal and blessings supernal from his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. <clears throat> when at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. <clears throat> I come to the garden of Dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear calling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and He walks with me, and He talks with me, and He tells me I am His own. And the joy we share as we carry them, none other has ever known. He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet. The birds hush, they sing, and the melody that he gave to me. Within my heart is ringing, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be holy. Let him bid me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling me, and he walks with me, and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry then, none other has ever known. On a hill far away stood an old a rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it at our Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross 
and exchange it someday for a crown. To the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. It shame and reproach gladly bear. Then you'll call me someday to my home or away. Where is glory forever I'll share? So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it some day for a crown. For our special music this morning, a song I hadn't sang in a long time. Well, I sang it this morning, but I haven't been singing it because it got lost, and I forgot about it. And uh, I'm glad that I've got it reinvigorated. I have journeyed through the long, dark night. Out on the open sea, my faith alone, sight unknown, and yet his eyes were watching me. The anchor holds. Though the ship is battered, the anchor holds. Though the sails are torn, I have fallen on my knees as I face the raging seas. The anchor holds. In spite of the storm, I've had visions, I've had dreams, I've even held them in my hands, but I never. They would slip right through Like they were only grains of sand The anchor holds Though the ship is battered The anchor holds Though the sails are torn, I have fallen on my knees as I face the raging seas. The anchor holds in spite of the storm. I have been young. But I'm older now And there has been beauty These eyes have seen But it was in the night Through the storms of my life That's where God proved His love up to me the anchor holds, though the ship 
is better. The anchor holds, though the sails are torn. I have fallen on my knees as I face the raging seas. The anchor holds in spite of the storm. I have fallen on my knees as I face the raging sea. The anchor holds in spite of the storm. Well, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16. We all know it and most of us have been quoting it since we were old enough to quote. If you were blessed to be raised in a Christian home, if not, you picked it up somewhere along the way. Anybody that, that claims to be a Christian probably knows John 3.16. Likely the most important verse in the Bible. I make it a point to quote John 3.16 in every sermon. It sums up everything God has done. It's the culmination of of God's love. It's the culmination of the Old Testament. The Old Testament led us to this point. This is the pinnacle. The promise that God made to Abraham. It comes out in the sacrifice of Jesus. God loved us so much that he gave us his one and only son, this morning, I want to look at the context and the deep meaning of this verse. Maybe we've been quoting this verse and lost sight of how powerful it is. Maybe we've been quoting this verse and lost sight of how important it is. Maybe we've been quoting this verse and not even giving it the proper respect it's due. Kind of like singing the old rugged cross from memory. Is it just a pretty song that we've heard all our lives and we love dearly or do when we're singing it do we does our mind go back to that that scene that horrible scene Jesus dying in the most excruciating manner known to man do we think about that does our heart break thinking about the fact that Jesus had to die to cover for our sins or communion been taking communion all our lives, most of us. Is that just a habit and tradition that we take for granted? Or is it a time of reflection of our own situation? Do we, in fact, do a self-examination or in the computer language these days, a self-diagnostic? Of course, we have the Holy Spirit to help us with that self-diagnostic. Maybe we don't want to hear what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us that we need changes we need to make. But when we're taking communion, are we thinking about the sacrifice that Jesus made and our own situation? Are we thinking about that or is it just a habit? We have to watch out about these things because human nature, the things that we do repetitively, we tend to take them for granted, don't we? First, let's look at the word love in John 3.16. We've discussed previously how the Greek that the New Testament was written in, and then we had to translate it because 
I, I don't speak Greek. Probably none of y'all do either. It was it was had to be translated. Well, in the Greek, they had something like 15 words. They were all translated love when they translated into English because there weren't 15 different words in English that covered that. Typically, in the Bible, when we talk about love, we're talking about agape love, which is the love for, for a fellow man. But in John 3, 16, it's not that, it's not agape love, it's the word I'm going to butcher this translation. I'll just go ahead and tell you. Ayatau. It means to treat with affection, to caress, love, to be fond of, wish well, take pleasure in, long for. Denotes the love of reason, <clears throat> esteem, to love, to feel, and exhibit esteem and goodwill to a person, to prize and delight in a thing. To feel and exhibit Esteem and goodwill to a person. That's what love is in this verse, John 3, 16. That's the love that Jesus was expressing. God extended his goodwill to us in the form of Jesus Christ. Obviously not for anything that we did because this was a long time before any of us were born. No, indeed. God loved us enough before we were born to send Jesus because God knew us well enough before we were born to realize that we were going to need a Savior. God did what had to be done and gave us his best, his one and only son, Jesus John chapter 3 verse 13 we're going to we're going to cover the the whole story <clears throat> Now there was a Pharisee a na man named Nicodemus who was a member of the Jewish ruling council He came to Jesus at night and said Rabbi we know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him Jesus replied very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How, how can someone be born again when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Nicodemus was not only a Pharisee, but a member of the ruling council. He was somebody well known. He had a position probably about the same level as a modern-day congressman or senator. He came to Jesus by night. And it doesn't say why, but we just have to wonder. Did he come to Jesus by night so as not to be seen by his peers? Remember, the typical Pharisee was no fan of Jesus. Did he fear losing his place at the table? But that's strictly sus suspicion. Nobody rose. It doesn't say. Maybe it just that's the first time he found time. Maybe he was so busy ruling on that council. And Jesus was so busy casting out demons and such that that was the first chance they had to get together. It doesn't say. But the first thing that Nicodemus does is admit that they know Jesus is someone special because of the miracles he'd been performing. They knew he had come from God. But Jesus jumps way past all of that. He tells old Nick, he said, nobody can be saved if they are not born again. He just jumps right into it, doesn't he? He knew, you know, Jesus could read people's heart. He knew how Nicodemus would respond to that. Nicodemus asked Jesus how that is. Nobody can enter back into their mother's womb. He knew Jesus wasn't talking about our literal rebirth, but he didn't know what Jesus was talking about. So come on, Jesus. Tell me what you're talking about. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh but the spirit gives birth to spirit. 
You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. John chapter 3, verse 13. Wait a minute, I didn't turn the page. Jesus explains the difference between being born of the flesh and being born of the Spirit. Jesus was referring to a spiritual rebirth. Out with the old and in with the new. Verse 10. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifts, lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Jesus compares himself to Moses in the wilderness. There were snakes attacking the children of Israel because of they. One of the many times they acted up. And God told Moses to make a golden serpent, put it up on a staff. And when the people would look up to that, they'd be healed. So that there'd already been a bunch of them died. But for the ones that got bit by the snakes, they look up that serpent and they'd be healed. This is something that Nicodemus would be well aware of since he was a teacher of the law. Jesus tells Nicodemus that he, Jesus, will also be lifted up. And then those who believe on him will be saved. Then Jesus utters those sacred words that we hold so dear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, let's not stop there. Let's go on. If we want to understand the verse really well, let's go on and keep reading. Verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Jesus explains that belief in him, Jesus, is what saves our soul. He also explains that Jesus did not come into this world to condemn the world, but the world already stands condemned, condemned, because they haven't believed in Jesus. God sent Jesus to be our lifeline. God sent Jesus to be our anchor. God sent Jesus to be our place of refuge. God sent Jesus to be our everything. It's my purpose to teach the Bible. And I will teach what it means to be a Christian. I will always talk about how Christians should talk, Christians should walk. About what it means to live a life worthy. But what I will never do is talk about how these good deeds will save you because they won't. Works will not save you. Works are a symptom of faith. James explains it so eloquently when he says faith without works are dead. And he speaks of a faith that can save and a faith that can't save. And the faith that can save is one that produces works. You see, because 
works are a symptom of faith. If you have the kind of faith that saves, you will be found following up with the works. But the works don't save you. It's the faith that saves you. We are not saved because of our works. We do our works because we are saved. There are things that a Christian should do and there are things that they shouldn't do. Sins of omission and commission. But that's not what saves us. What saves us is that precious blood that Jesus shed on Calvary's cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. The reason Jesus came to earth was that so he could live and then die. He couldn't die until he lived and then live again. In lieu of that sacrifice, we are honored to live a life that reflects our faith. But we always know that our works aren't good enough. It's only through the blood of the perfect Savior that we are saved. And when you look at the magnitude of the sacrifice that was made, the precious blood of the Son of God, why would we think that anything we could do would be good enough? But also, in lieu of that sacrifice, how dare we not do our best to live for Jesus every day? That would include telling others about the sacrifice Jesus made and doing works to honor that sacrifice. But remembering at all times that our works can't save us. It is only Jesus' precious blood that can wash our sins away.